But he was high church, but he was also evangelical. He would have loved the hymns that we sang today, the singing of the congregation. He felt just as the denomination should not be divided, so the various parties in the Episcopal Church, you know we have a high church, we have a low church, they should all come together. And I felt that spirit so strongly with you today. I want to say a little bit more about Brent today. I want to come back. I'm going to love to meet with members of the congregation about more books that I need to study, more articles, and then my prize is to be invited to go, of course, to the Philippines one of these days. And to go up to Luzon and to see where you're from, uh, which will mean so much to me. Why did I get interested in Charles Henry Brent? Because I'm his successor. He was the bishop, as I said, of Western New York from 1919 to 1929, and I was the bishop from 2010 to 2019. And I knew that he was a great man, and yet nobody remembered him in the diocese, which really irritated me. I mean, nobody, uh, they, they had a very rich, very conservative bishop in the 1950s uh, in Western New York, and they all remember this guy because he was driven around in a big black Cadillac. And I went around in a little red Prius. <laughs> and the, in those days, even at Long Island, the bishop had a, cattle, had a big Cadillac and had a driver with a uniform. And people loved that sort of stuff. But here, there was this great figure, Brent, that nobody ever even talked about. And so I was a missionary for 10 years. They're so glad I'm gone because they don't have to hear about Bishop Brent again. <laughs> so you're getting to hear about him today. Um, I followed in his footsteps. I was thinking about that today. Your pulpit here looks very much like the pulpit at St. Paul's Cathedral in Buffalo, and that's where Brent preached all the time. And so I preached there. My very final farewell service, I wore Brent's mitre and Brent's um, sir, his, his coat. And his, so I looked. Like he was very, very tall. I'm shorter than he was. One thing I'm very happy to learn about is that I wondered about the love life of Bishop Brent. Because I never found anything about it. He was never married. And I thought, you know, what was it like? And in one of the articles that Father Dario sent me, they said that he was in love with a woman he was going to meet in Rome on a kind of a, a little sprint. What can we do? I call it. I mean, I don't want to say a little affair, but you know, you fill it in. And she wrote him a letter and said, I found somebody else I followed in love. So I'm going to add that in. If anybody knows about his love life, tell me more about it. I don't know about it. But I think the reason I'm preaching about Brent and talking about Brent in our church today is that I think he speaks to our time because remember, after World War I, there was a great pandemic epidemic that went from 1918 until 1921. A hundred million people died, so it's not unlike our time. There had been a war. There was huge racial division in this time. And the churches were at one another's throats, as we gotta be honest, I was preaching about that. We're at one another's throats now. We're not unified. So he brought a, a, a message to his time, which I mentioned for our time. He had this wonderful career in all sorts of ways. He was the head of the International Opium Commission. He was the head chaplain in World War uh, I for American forces. He was elected twice as Bishop of Washington. He turned him down, and I don't know why he went to Buffalo, except in his time, Buffalo was a very rich city. In my time, Buffalo was a very poor city, so I mean, I don't see why he came, but I'm glad he did come here because he led a wonderful life in Buffalo. And then his greatest thing was to found the Faith and Order Movement which was the beginning of the ecumenical movement leading to church unity. At the same time, he wrote 20 books. He got about 10 honorary degrees. He was on the cover of Time Magazine. How many bishops in the Episcopal Church get on the cover of Time Magazine? And when he died, there was an uh, editorial about him in the New York Times about his contributions. The thing I told you already in the story, I won't tell you again, about his arrest for getting uh, a street 
car going too fast. And when I arrived in Buffalo, in Western New York, I had been living in Rome, Italy. Uh, my wife uh, was the head of the American Academy. I was the director at one period of the Anglican Center, and we lived in Rome. In Rome, you can go 90 miles an hour on the, on the main highways. So up in, uh, up in uh, Western New York, you've got uh, you know, the Thruway 90. It's at 90. And I thought, this is just like it. It's 90 miles an hour. Uh oh, well, guess what? It wasn't 90 miles an hour. So I got up to about 35 speeding tickets, coming close to his record. And one day, I was pulled over, and he said, Bishop, if you get one more ticket, you're going to jail. And I'm like, oh, no. I'm going to just be like him. There's going to be a picture of me in jail to go into class. <laughs> so I really, I'm a terrible driver. I'm so happy I don't have to drive as much anymore. I come by, I came out here by this, and that's what I use. I don't use a car. So, a hero for our times. Let me talk about some of the things that shaped his life, that made him the man he was. He was from Canada, so he was an immigrant to the United States. He could not get a job as a priest in Canada. So he came across the border to Buffalo. He was very high church, and so in those days, almost all of his churches did not put candles on the altar. And so what he did was he wanted beautiful worship. So his, he was the chaplain at a small church called St. Andrew's. You know, many things in the Philippines are called St. Andrew's yes. because of his first assignment was St. Andrew's. He put candles on the altar. The bishop, the second bishop of New York, came one day and said, I don't want those candles on the altar. They look like Italian things, and I hate Italians. Get those things off. I don't want any posters there. He said, I'm not going to do that. And the bishop, right on the spot, said, you're fired. What does that sound like? <laughs> so he said, goodbye, Buffalo. He went to Boston. He was an associate member of the Cowley Fathers. And through that work with the Cowley Fathers, he became a slum priest, as they called those priests in those days, in a, the, the west end of, of Boston. He, he had a parish nobody wanted to go to. He built it up into one of the great parishes in America, bringing all parts of the, of the population of Boston to that parish. On the wrong side of the tracks, he built a great church, a great parish. And so when the United States had acquired the Philippines after the Spanish-American War, the House of Bishops said, we need an Episcopal bishop in the Philippines, so in 1901, the House of Bishops elected him as the Bishop of the Philippines. And that's when he went to the Philippines. And then he stayed in the Philippines until 1970, when he became the head chaplain of the United States. And you know the story of his mission there. The Episcopal Church said, you've got to bring the Roman Catholics into the Episcopal Church. He said, no. They're already Christians. What we need to do is evangelize people who do not know Jesus. And that's why he turned to Luzon, went up into the mountains, began this great mission to your ancestors to bring the, 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 the Christian faith to the Hebrew population. Manila and the Roman Catholic, 90% of, of the of Philippines, he said, stay with that. We're not gonna change, we're gonna invite people in. And your Christian faith, I would like to say today, is partly a gift of Richard Brent, if I may say. He brought it to your people. He lifted them up. He built these great institutions. We've been talking about it right now. These great schools. So he believed that the church needed to give people a better life on this earth. To bring God's kingdom to this earth. He saw already that opium was a factor that was leading to the death of many people in the Philippines. You know, it's almost, you know what I would say, so parallel, like this opioid crisis, we've had a discussion. You know what I'm talking about? People were taking opioids. They got addicted to it. It was killing, and it's still killing people in cities and small towns all over. He said, that's the same thing that's going on with the opium trade. So stop that trade. And he was appointed as the head of the World Opium Commission. 
mission. Think about that. Going out until his death in 1929, fighting for the end of that trade and the destruction of people's lives. Then he became the chaplain of the United States Army in Europe. He brought that experience from the Philippines, working with your people to be a chaplain. He said, I'm going to be the chaplain of everybody. The Jews, the Muslims, and the Christians. All are going to be welcomed at my door. I'm going to bring them together in the United States. And he said, look at what this war, World War I, has basically brought chaos to the earth. Not in light right now. Our whole societies, monarchies have been destroyed. The church has got to be out there healing people, but it's never going to heal people without this united Christian movement called the Faith and Order Movement. And then he came to Western New York. Now I've got to be honest with you. When I've read from Father has sent me to other Philippine priests have now sent me articles. In the Philippines, he built all these institutions. He was a great force in society. Not so much in Buffalo. <laughs> You know what? He was on the road in all of these activities. He spent three years in Switzerland on the World Council of, of, the, of the Faith and Order Movement. And you know why he did that? Because Buffalo has the worst weather in the United States. <laughs> he said, I'm going to go there. But what he did, he had this great gift of friendship. Uh, Rockefeller was one of his friends. J.P. Morgan was one of his friends. He had this gift of, you know what I'm talking about, fundraising? <laughs> For Jesus, that's not a bad thing. So he was able to finance this great movement, the Faith and Order Movement. And in 1927, had his first meeting. And you know what he believed? That the Faith and Order Movement should be like the United Nations of Churches. Every denomination would be sitting in the room just like this. And we would say, well, why can't we share communion? Why can't we share ministry? Let's use just one example of that. Presbyterians. They don't have bishops. We have bishops. We say that that's a fundamental barrier of why we can't share, share communion and ministry. Maybe not. Why don't we sit down in a room like this and talk about that and stop being divided into Presbyterians? Methodists are not exactly like us. Why can't we do something with Methodists? We are in communion with the Lutherans now. But that's what he did at this great conference in 1930. The greatest theologians of the world came to him. They sat down. They talked. They almost came to blows right before it came to it about sharing communion. Some people didn't like that idea, and they were about to do this. He said, let's all stop and go and have a drink. Can I say one thing? Bishop Brent loved to have a little cocktail hour before a meeting, because he said that will calm everybody down. You know why I think he had this great conference in Switzerland? Because in the United States, we were under prohibition. And you couldn't have a cocktail hour in the United States. So let's go to another country where people, and he got all the people in the room together eating and drinking and talking. And they ended up as friends in 1927. And that's why he got on the cover of time, because he had this great achievement. But he wore himself out from work. You hear all that I'm saying? Here's a guy that worked his behind off for Jesus in the Philippines, on the battlefield, building this movement, and so his heart wore out in 1929, and he died in his beloved city of Lausanne, Switzerland, where he had had this great conference, and that's where he's buried today. He's buried there, let me tell you one story, and I'll say a few spiritual things that he said. The day after I was consecrated bishop of Western New York, a former bishop's wife called me and said, Bill, the first thing you've got to do is pay the rent on Bishop Brent's burial place in Los Angeles, Switzerland, or they'll throw him into town dump in about two weeks. So I thought, this is pretty, I guess that was my first act of Bishop Brent. I, I called Switzerland, I found out how much I had to pay. You know, it's like somebody who is at a college barrier, and you've got to pay your bill on where you are, or they'll move you. So I got him, he's safe, but now. Uh, and he has a, a beautiful monument there in Switzerland. So his life comes to an end in 1929. But because of you're here today, because I'm here today, he has fundamentally changed the Christian church. We need to honor him. Let me close with just a few.
few spiritual points about Grant, and then I'm going to open it up to any questions you might want to ask about it. One second. This is, these are two colleagues. He was a wonderful writer of prayers. If you go at our prayer book at morning prayer and say, Lord Jesus Christ, who stretched out his arms of love on the hard wood of the cross. Everybody know that? Guess who wrote that? That's your prayer. Every time you go into that prayer book and look at the morning prayer and see that, think of it, who stretched out his arms of love on the hard wood of the cross. Meaning, he was embracing everybody, which was a great theme of Grant. But these are two colleagues that he wrote that really speak to our time of COVID coming to an end, of division in our country, of uncertainty. This is what he writes to us. Lord Jesus Christ, in the days of your earthly career, you did gather into the life of God the fullness of human pain as a fact of experience in order that you might flood the life of men and women with your divine help. Remember it now in your triumphant light in heaven, your former woes when you were on earth, and sustain us in your compassionate and healing arms. Banish my depression and fears by the cheering gladness of your unfailing sympathy, and encircle me with the soothing folds of your victorious fullness, giving me faith sufficient to drink deep drafts of faith from your abundant strength and strength, that I may not die, but that I might live and declare the works of the Lord and glorify your name forever and ever. A second, and a second great colleague. Grant us, Lord, the will to live Christianity, that by faith in your might, we might storm the fortress of evil, and set free as prisoners into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That prayer for liberty is a prayer for the United States right now, and I think it's a prayer for the Philippines right now. We are both joined together in asking the Lord to protect our liberty, to protect our freedoms, and to bring us closer to God's kingdom. That's what Red represented me, and that's what I think is worth our remembering him this day. Thank you very much. I was so happy to be able to speak to you about this, and now I'm happy to answer any questions you have about it, or any comments anybody would like to make about going to Brent School, of experiencing Brent's work in the Philippines, whatever you'd like to say. Father Darius, you have some comments. In the lobby, in the St. Andrew's Theological Seminary, in Manila, there's this picture of Bishop Brett, and uh, I remember it right. The description there is a soldier of Christ, father of humanism, in servant of humanity. Soldier of Christ, apostle of Christ, in servant of uh, humanity. Thank you, Bishop, for that presentation. That's a very good show. So, I suggest you need to have an icon of Bishop Brett. I mean, he's in our prayer book as one of the commemorated people, I was saying. I have an icon of Bishop Brett. So you might get somebody to paint him an 